Welcome back, good people, to another episode. I'm Dr. Amber. We've got Dr. Tamika, Dr. Lakeisha, and Dr. Kristen, and we make up the CAPE-MD. And so we're going to tell you a little bit more about the origin of that name. We're also going to talk about the Superwoman Complex today and how that relates to our name. And then we're going to end by talking about how we are all feeling and dealing with the world reopening again. So what's the Cape MD mean? Dr. Dr. Lakeisha, tell us a little bit more about that. Of course, of course, with pleasure. So the Cape MD, so first of all, y'all are probably like, what in the hell is C4 PE? So the number four is a play off the fact that we are four African-American female physicians who have come together because we're all very passionate and dedicated towards reducing healthcare disparities in women, but particularly in communities of color, uh, minority communities. And the CAPE stems from the topic of superwoman or the superwoman phenomenon. Oftentimes, women hold jobs, they're moms, they're wives, they are on various boards, they've got pets, they do laundry, they cook, they do dishes. And so it's the superwoman phenomenon that we have own, all grown up knowing and sometimes appreciating and sometimes not. And so that's where the Cape MD comes from. The Cape uh, meaning superwoman Cape, the number four indicating that there's four of us and the MD obviously because we're all physicians, uh, medical physicians. And so we came together in addition to uh, disseminate pertinent health information uh, physical, mental, and spiritual information in a transparent format, uh, authentically, where we meet all women exactly where they are. So it's similar to giving you medical information, but using ourselves as real life authentic stories, because at the end of the day, we're people first and physicians second. So with respect to the superwoman complex, unbeknownst to many, that's actually a phenomenon that's been studied called the superwoman schema. And it's been studied amongst specifically African-American women. And there are four basically complexes or categories. Um, and through each episode that you'll see us discussing in the future, uh, there will be some interweaving of at least one of these complexes or components in each of our topics. So the obligation to manifest strength, the obligation to suppress emotions, the resistance to being vulnerable or dependent. Uh, as women, we're all determined to succeed depending upon where you're from. It's often despite limited resources. And then finally, the obligation to help others. So basically, some people are in favor of some of these components or all of these components or none of these components. And that's the beauty of it. We all each individually have our own personality and thoughts about the superwoman complex. And moving forward with each show that we bring to you, we each will have our own own opinions which will make this hilarious but informative <laughs> so we've talked about this extensively and i actually love the superwoman complex love hate relationship i think with it i don't really want my daughter or my nieces to grow up feeling like they have to be a superwoman but for me that's where i do my best work i actually like it <laughs> um but I know that other people do not feel that way, Dr. Kristen. Uh, um, uh, Dr. Lakeisha? Who's my yeah. language? I have to have that shit. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, I think it's very empowering to know that if I have to, I can do it all. But at the end of the day, even if I can do it all, I don't want to do it all, all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I'm kind of in between. There's parts of it that I embrace um, and that I'm proud of. I'm, I'm proud to be the first physician in my family. Um, you know, I feel like too much, to whom much is given, um, much is expected. 
Um, but I want to set, I want to be my own boss. I want to set my own expectations. I don't want society to dictate what I'm supposed to be doing and who I'm supposed to be doing it for. I want to, I want to play by, you know, a different, a different set of rules that I've established and that I um, honor. And I think that, um, I think that for me, it's empowering. And so I think that people should embrace whatever parts of it that they feel like fit them and they should feel free to reject whatever parts don't fit them. I think for me, it's just a label. I don't like the label because with the label comes a whole slew of expectations. Um, and just expectations in general creates for me a level of stress and anxiety because then I'm trying to meet all of those expectations. So I choose to just do away with the label. I don't like it. I'm going to blaze my own path, set my own expectations uh, based upon what my own purpose and journey is in this life. And um, whoever doesn't like it, I'd say something bad, but I'm not. <laughs> Kick rocks. With so no <laughs> as moms and as wives and um, employers, employees, um, how are we dealing with the fact that, you know, we've, we've been dealing with this COVID-19 for several weeks now, almost two months. How are mm -hmm. we dealing with the stress of governors and states opening back up? At some point, things are going to open back up, whether we agree with it or not. Um, I think the better question and the thing that we should be focusing on is what one, what feels right for your family and your financial situation and your personal comfort level, right? What feels right to you. Um, and then what I think that we can offer is just ways to make sure that um, you are protecting yourselves in the best way that you can and protecting others um, if, and will, if and when you feel comfortable um, going out into this new normal. Being physicians, you know, people are looking at us to see what we're going to do also, which is an even more added pressure. You know, we don't want to walk in fear, but want to be responsible. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's what's hard is the gray area between walking in fear and being potentially reckless. Right. I think the hardest part of the shutdown for me, as you guys know, is just that I have not been able to see my family, my parents. You know, I'm I'm essentially an essential worker. I've still been working in my office, in my clinic. My parents live 12 minutes from me. My mother-in-law lives five minutes from me. And I, I mean, I can't go see my family at all. Like I have kept my distance. My dad is a pediatrician and he's getting older and I can't talk to him about this. I can't hug them. I, and I'm, you know, I, what's even more sad is my kids can. They love being with them mm -hmm. and they they can't be with them and, and that's, just to clarify dr tinkaminga you, like you've had COVID positive patients um you've been treating families um throughout this pandemic um in indiana where you practice and so your exposure is real i guess i have mixed feelings you know as a physician and as a mother and as a small business owner and as a contract worker from an anesthesiologist perspective, you know, um, contrary to what many believe, physicians, we ain't rich, okay, we're not rich, uh, unless you practice like 20 years ago, that's real talk. Um, we all have debt, you know, six-figure debt, and so there's a um, dichotomy between having one foot in the I need to make some money door and having another foot in the I'm a physician, I know the ramifications of COVID-19 door. Um, and so I think at the end of the day, you just have to be uh, well informed, uh, which means not watching news outlets. That's not how you get informed, okay? Um, and then once you're well informed, then you make personal decisions with respect to your personal scenarios. 
Um, and for me, owning a clinic that treats people who are actively suicidal, actively um, in severe depression, actively PTSD, um, a lot of nurses and physicians are coming to me because of the trauma associated with treating patients with COVID-19. So despite what you hear that this illness is not bad, it is bad. You know, as a physician, seeing and hearing the stories about how it's impacting people who have no comorbidities, who are young, it's impacting multiple organs, not just your lungs. So seeing what it does, it's bad. So don't let any news outlet tells you that it's just the flu. It ain't just the flu. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Kristen, what are you going to, I mean, I know that you have a business that will be able to open up soon. What have you been doing to make the necessary precautions to take care of your employees as well as um, your customers? Yeah. So because we are not an essential um, business, you know, we, we're mostly doing aesthetics and purely elective things. So mm -hmm. unlike Dr. Lakeisha's clinic, um, so for us, we won't be able to reopen until phase two. So we have a little bit more time to put certain policies in place. Um, like Dr. Lakeisha, you know, we're going to require all of our patients to come in with a mask. We are going to have the appropriate um, personal protective equipment for um, our esthetician um, and for ourselves when we're doing um, the aesthetic procedures. Um, we're going to be putting in policies to where we space out appointments so that we don't have people congregating or waiting in the waiting room. Mm -hmm. So we are definitely going to put some policies in place that are going to put patient safety and staff safety above profits. It's no longer about how many people can I see in an hour, in a day, in a week. It's how many people can we see safely and responsibly? I think that that's really hard too, is that, you know, I have friends who live in Atlanta. I went to college in Atlanta, I went to Spelman and, you know, talking to them, their fear. And so I think one of the important things I try to tell them is like, everyone should be in a mask right now. We're not at the point where we can't wear a mask. Like, we're not there yet. As you can see in this image, you know, a healthy person with a mask and then the carrier doesn't have on a mask, the, trans the transmis transmission probability is 70%. Well, it goes down to 1.5% if both people have on a mask. So it's really important that we understand that we both that everyone, whether you are a whether you know you're a carrier and you have symptoms or you're a healthy person, if everyone wears a mask, we decrease our probability of getting that disease by 98%. And that is really where we are at. That is really where we want to be. That's an important point. And the mask, if you know, if most people don't have access to the medical grade N95 mask. And so the mask needs to be of a thicker fabric um, that still allows you to um, to breathe. Um, so you know, just make sure that the if it's a, fa a fabric mask, that it's a it's a good quality, thicker um, thicker mask. And um, uh, surgical masks are perfect as well. Um, the N95 masks are and should be reserved for healthcare workers. Um, if there's any healthcare workers out there watching this, physician or nurse. Who are, who's in need of an N95 mask. Uh, we also have a charity. Uh, you can visit www.maskahero.com, fill out a request form, and we will get a surgical mask to you. Um, and in return, if you want to donate, unuse surgical mask or provide a monetary donation so that we can outfit physicians and nurses with masks. Uh, same thing, you fill out a donation form at www.maskahero.com. So um, I think, you know, when I, when I think about opening up and everybody opening up, regardless on whether or not we agree on it or not, it's happening. It's clearly mm -hmm. happening. Multiple states are doing it. I'm hoping that we are doing it responsibly, responsibly, but it's happening. So um, I think what I, what I want people to learn from opening up is that the virus has not all of a sudden gone away. It's still here. And so one of the things that I saw this weekend was a whole bunch of people in Indianapolis, Indiana, congregating 
in a huge crowd and the fear that I have and my anxiety went up because all of these people are essentially congregating in a small area um, and I'm sure they were having big fun but what what I see all I it's see a parking is, lot that's nuts yeah. y'all that's nuts it's a, park, it's a parking lot it's a parking lot and all I see is COVID like all I see is COVID-19 patients all I see is them either getting COVID or taking it to their moms or grandmothers their spouses and so my fear and anxiety goes up because this is not what we want to see we do not want to see you going out and congregating in large crowds like this. And even in the parameters that were set by our governor, you know, right now it's only supposed to be 10 or less people. And that actually doesn't even start until tomorrow. So we've got to be more responsible than we've been because what could potentially happen from this crowd is a huge peak in cases. And the concern with another peak is if we are going to open up, we don't want to just open up to shut down. That is not the goal. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, you know, to, to your point, to me, I think this is an important point to bring up. The social distancing is not meant to stop the virus. It's meant to slow things down such that you don't overwhelm hospital systems that have a limited number of ventilators or breathing machines and that have a limited number of protective of, of personal protective equipment that that is the primary one of the primary reasons for having the social distance orders this virus is like like you said earlier it's not going away but we just don't want to overwhelm healthcare workers and healthcare systems that may not be ready if too many people get too sick at the same time yeah what do you say to people dr lakeisha when people are like i'm anxious like i'm having anxiety about not seeing my family i'm having anxiety about going back to work because i mean even though some people want to open up there's other people who are scared to step foot back into their office buildings and so what are we doing about that and what can we do about that Sure. So first, um, just a disclaimer, I'm a general anesthesiologist, you know, and so before somebody says, you know, well, who the hell are you to be given advice on mental illness? Um, I'll tell you the following. I'll tell you that I myself suffered from depression. Um, I call it functional depression. I call it fake it till I make it. Um, I lost one colleague in private practice to suicide. I lost a resident classmate in residency to suicide and I lost an attending to suicide. So physician suicide, although possibly uh, unheard of, is not uncommon and it's definitely something that needs to be discussed. And then finally, uh, I have room to talk, so to speak, because I own a wellness center that uses alternative treatment called ketamine, which is an anesthetic to treat treatment-resistant depression and active suicidality. And recently, because of COVID-19, I've seen anxiety increase and my patient volume has increased. Business has increased for me, but sadly, it's been frontline workers, nurses, and physicians. So why is that? You know, um, I think from a general public standpoint with respect to fear and anxiety, the first thing you have to recognize is that you have zero control over the virus, right? You have zero control over the virus, over the spread, over the transmission, over anything. But what you do have control over is your own thoughts and your own behavior and your own actions. So what does that mean? I understand that some of us are not financially in a place where we can stay home. That's fine. If you have to go to work to make a living to feed your family, do so responsibly, right? Wear a mask. When you come home, shower before you interact with your family. If you're at work, request that people respect your boundaries, which should be six feet. If you're in customer service, request that people wear a mask. If they are not providing masks for clients or patients coming in, then you double mask, right? You wear masks, you wear gloves, you make sure that you have high protective wear on because the virus can penetrate any membrane, right? Mucous membranes. 
Um, so that's number one. Number two, monitor your intake. What do I mean by that? What you watch, what you read, who you talk to, anybody who feeds your fears, anything that feeds your fears, okay? It's going to be hard because sometimes that might be Cousin Joe, Sister Susie, Grandma Betty. You got to cut it off because at the end of the day, uh, information overload, particularly when it's negative, it's just going to feed your fears, right? And fear and unknowns will lead to anxiety. And when anxiety goes unchecked, you'll have these physical manifestations that you see on the screen where you're feeling uneasy, you have problems sleeping because you have racing thoughts at night. Um, sometimes you can get sweaty palms, you can get short of breath, almost as if you're having a panic attack, you're restless, you can't focus. Um, days turn into weeks, you don't know if it's Monday or Sunday, and you just are antsy. And so the clinical definition of generalized anxiety disorder is if once a month, these symptoms like worry, restlessness, and fatigue are now weekly symptoms. And this has been going on for at least six months. So we're already almost two months in the game. So by summertime, you're still every week basically worrying about worrying, then you should seek help because you now have clinical generalized anxiety disorder. Now, if generalized anxiety disorder is not managed appropriately, then there's a slippery slope to the following. Depression is one that I'll highlight that you see at the bottom left part of the screen. And um, psychotic thoughts, or also known as psych psychopath, or psycho psycho, you know what I'm trying to say, psychopathy, <laughs> um, at the bottom right side of the screen and full-blown panic attacks. Um, so I think we have to recognize the triage. Triage means what happens first, what should be giving the most uh, attention to in terms of severity, right? So worry comes first. Um, so how do you cut off worry? You recognize that you don't have to know all the answers, right? And you control what you intake and who you allow to penetrate your thoughts. Then from worry comes stress. Stress is a normal phenomenon, right? When you get too busy or you have a deadline or even now with homeschooling, hello, second grade is about to kick my butt. But there's stress, that's normal, just recognize that, okay? Then you have to figure out how do you manage your stress, right? So worry or fear, then comes stress, and then if you don't check or manage the stress, then the anxiety comes, which we've already talked about. And from the anxiety, you slip into clinical generalized anxiety disorder and possibly depression and honestly, possibly PTSD. Um, so this is just a little take home tool that you guys can pay attention to on how to um, address any of these symptoms that might come up. So for example, if you're having difficulty sleeping, it's very important to have good sleep hygiene every night. Uh, cut yourself off with respect to blue light. So cell phone, television, uh, have the same sleep hygiene every single night. And if you need to use sleep agents in the form of melatonin or uh, CBD or even prescription sleep agents such as Ambien for this interim time frame, I think everything in moderation is fine. Uh, I will caution you not to self-medicate on things such as um, alcohol or um, marijuana or uh, other drugs that are out there. Um, and then finally, talking about shortness of breath or racing hearts, there are things that you can do to manage that. If you're into alternative treatments, you can think about meditation. There are various apps on the phone. You can take up yoga as a practice. You can take up running as a practice. I became a runner. Who knew? Um, you can do things such as virtual counseling. There's no reason that anybody who needs help can't get help right now. There are multiple websites. Two that come to mind are listed there, therapyforblackgirls.com, therapyforblackmen.org. And this isn't inclusive with respect to uh, just African Americans, but uh, talkspace.com, mindfulness.com. There are many avenues out there. So tap into something or tap into someone. But the moral of the story is to recognize and take action before it's too late.
Well, I want to thank you guys for joining us for another episode of Cape and B. Um, we will see you guys next week. Have a good day. Bye, Bye. guys. Peace out. Cheers. <laughs>